We're going to start with Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin talked about the three great virtues. And the three virtues are industry, thrift, and prudence. And because we have often violated these three principles, uh, we have not been successful. He said, these are the three principles of success in life. So if I was to write a motivational book uh, by Tony Robbins or something like that, it would be on these three great virtues. Industry, thrift, and virtue, so it's, it's prudent. So let's see how well we're doing. Industry, for, Amer for most Americans, that's no problem. We tend to be overworked and underpaid. We work 24 seven. And in today's world, with everybody with their cell phones and um, uh, iPhones, smartphones and so forth, it's just constant. Whenever you have a, a moment where you're not paying attention, I find this with my students. Who knows what they're doing while I am lecturing? I, I've given up trying to get their attention. But <clears throat> so I don't think that's a problem. Even those who are on welfare, and my wife and I live near Yonkers, New York, uh, even people on welfare, they don't want to sit around. They're busy. They're doing work. They're getting paid for it. And they're still getting welfare because it's, it's the black market that they're engaged in. And as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. You want them working. The worst thing you want are Americans who are slothful and just don't care. So, and, and people are like that. They don't like to sit around. So I don't think we have any problem with industry. Now, we do have a problem with trained people. We have a lot of people who are untrained. And I think one of the tragedies is that government is creating a situation that's really bad for those people, and that's called the minimum wage law. Because you want to incur, you want to have lots of jobs available. When young people want to work in the afternoons or in the evenings, uh, uh, pay their way through college, you don't want to make it difficult. When in the early 1970s, when I was working my way through college, I had a bunch of different jobs. Uh, I started, uh, uh, when I came back from my mission uh, back in 1970, I had $50 to my name. And in two years, because of all the different jobs I had, I had no student loans, I had some scholarships which helped, but I also worked so many different jobs, including being a janitor, that in two years uh, I had a fully, uh, I had a new job with the CIA, I had a car fully paid for, brand new car, a red Opal, and uh, I had a, a fiance who I later married, my wife Joanne. So uh, how was I able to do that? Because I worked a lot of hours minimum wage work. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, thrift is another uh, important one that I think we suffer from because we live in a consumer society where we waste a lot of money and so really the key and especially young people. The hardest thing, uh, one of my quotes in the maximums is one of the hardest things in the world to do is for young people to save and for old people to spend. And I make this point all the time about spending because as you know, people are always using all kinds of excuses, but mainly money excuses not to go somewhere. Oh, you want to go with us on that cruise? Oh, I can't afford it. Oh, do you want to go to Israel with us and, and walk where Jesus walked? Wouldn't that be really cool? No, I can't afford it. Uh, you want to come to Freedom Fest, the world's largest gathering of free minds in Las Vegas? $4.95 per person, $7.95 per couple. No, nope, can't afford it. And I said, you know what? You're going to die a millionaire. Spend your money. So anyway, it's my, my personal view. <laughs> thrift. It's really important. And unfortunately, we, we're not a thrifty nation like we should be. But they are in Asia. They are in Europe. They are in Switzerland. And that's why they're catching up and surpassing us. The third one is prudence. Prudence. How many of us are prudent? You know, when I met in the New Orleans conference last November, or last October, several people came up to me and I, they said, I've lost 70% of my portfolio in the last five years. And I said, how's that possible when the stock market is reaching almost an all-time high? 
And they said, well, we came to the New Orleans conference, we went into the exhibit hall, we bought all those junior mining stocks, and we're down 70%. I said, you put all your money in that? Oh, yes. I bought into the financial terrorist report that the dollar is going to collapse. You need to get out of the stock market that was moving up and get into gold and silver that was moving down, a double whammy loss. I said, what are you doing here at the New Orleans conference? Oh, we're doubling down. That's what they said, <laughs> doubling down. <laughs> so you see, they violated the principle of prudence, which is diversification. In my class, financial economics at Chapman University, we talk about the modern portfolio theory, which says that uh, diversification increases or reduces your risk and increases your return. So I think that's a, a really good, good approach. So uh, Richest Man in Babylon is a wonderful book. I recommend, any, any of you read The Richest Man in Babylon? Fantastic book, highly recommend it. Tells the story of a certain man named Arkad, far and wide, was famed for his great wealth, famed for his liberality, generous in his charities, generous with his family, went to Freedom Fest every year. Well, that, that's, that's not in there. Liberal on his own expenses, but nevertheless, each year his wealth increased more rapidly than he spent it, mainly because no matter how much he, um, no matter how much he spent, he always earned more. Uh, no matter how much he earned, he always held back a little bit and saved, saved some. That's really important. Uh, there you are about savings. You can see, you've seen a little blip up. The media criticized Americans for saving during the financial crisis of 2008, but I thought it was a good thing. Now this is, of course, the scariest of all of the uh, slides I'm going to show you. This is asset class returns versus the average investor, 20-year period from 1993 to 2013. So the best performing sector was energy. You can see the S&P 500 uh, also had a decent return of almost 10% during this time period annually. You go down to 30-year treasuries, that returned uh, 6%. You go over to gold, even gold, uh, let's see, gold right there returned a little under 8%, so that's not bad. Then look at T-bills, T-bills returned about 3% during this time period. And then what's next to T-bills? The average investor only underperformed T-bills. How's that possible? Well, there's two reasons. One is trying to beat the market with cherry picking, buying individual stocks that we thought would do really well. That's what I specialize in in my newsletter, so. <laughs> It's, uh, I give people what they want, and individual, sto individual stocks tell a story. People love stories. So that's the popular way to go. But I also recommend mutual funds that have done really well over the years. And then the other one is trading, buying and selling to avoid a bear market. How many have suffered from that concern and ended up s selling too soon? Getting out of the market and seeing the market continue to move higher. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, Peter Lynch of the Magellan Fund, the most successful mutual fund in 15-year history from 1975 to 1990. Peter Lynch, how many remember him? Peter Lynch, oh good, almost all of you. He's written a book called One Up on Wall Street. Best performing mutual fund for 15 years. And he said that their study showed that the average shareholder lost money on his fund. Why? Because when the market was going up, they said, oh, this can't last, I'm gonna take my profits. Or when the market's going down, they panic and they got out at the bottom. Both mistakes in the marketplace. So, as I say in the maxims of Wall Street, the hardest thing in the world to do is to hold on to your stocks during a bear market, right? You all agree with that? Well, guess what? The hardest thing to do in the world is to hold on to your stocks during a bull market. Now, those sound contradictory, don't they? 
and yet both of them are true. So uh, buy and hold, that's a very tough thing to, to do, thick and thin. So I've written a, a book on this subject called Investing in One Lesson, Wall Street Exaggerates Everything. I wrote this, uh, I came up with this title 20 years ago, but I just couldn't figure out what the lesson was. I thought, what a clever title, Investing in One Lesson. But then I couldn't figure out the uh, the, what the lesson was until a light came on. I said, wow, Wall Street exaggerates everything. The business of investing is not the same as investing in a business. So true. And of course, this chart, which I show every year at the Las Vegas Money Show, how many have seen this chart? Uh, a couple of you, but uh, it's always worth seeing again. So what we have here is the uh, blue line is the S&P 500, that's Wall Street. And the red line is the real economy, that's real GDP. So that's gone up with a few blips along the way. So there's a couple of things that's interesting about this chart. Number one is it starts the same and 20 years, 25 years later, it ends the same, right? So does buy and hold work? Yes, it does. But, and, and the reason it works, by the way, is because we have essentially a free market capitalist system. Remember that, that's the only reason that the markets have a long-term upward trend, is because we have free market capitalists. Despite every effort by our politicians, Congress and presidents of the United States to thwart the American free enterprise spirit, we continue to have success and move ahead, all right? But how many of us are willing to, how many of us can handle the roller coaster ride? That's the problem, because we have a tendency to sell out at one point or another during this 25, 24 year period. That is, that is the danger. But buy and hold does still work in the index of markets. So my favorite way to beat the market is uh, through dividends. Dividends don't lie. Of course, earnings lie, cash flow lies, revenues lie. Heck, even dividends lie to some extent, uh, especially if, uh, if they're paying out dividends that are return of capital, then they're, they're a lie in a sense. So there's no such thing as a pure system, but I kind of like the dividend approach. My favorite story is uh, IBM versus Exxon, Big Blue versus Big Oil. This is actually from Jeremy Siegel's study, which is very, very profound. So you have one growth stock and one value stock. One of these stocks outperformed the other dramatically over this uh, long period of time. In 19, let's take 1950. In 1950, you put $1,000 into Big Blue, IBM, and you put $1,000 into Big Oil or Exxon, and you hold it until today. Who outperformed the other? And before you answer that question, you ask, you, you, uh, let me ask you the question, which one of the two uh, was a better performer in terms of the fundamental matrices that we all look at as analysts? Which one outperformed in terms of revenue growth, earnings growth, cash flow growth, dividends. What's your answer? Who says IBM? Who says Exxon? Well, we don't have too many bright students here, unfortunately. <laughs> it is IBM. It was the growth story of this time period. It grew much faster. On average, three percentage points more than the value play Exxon, the stodgy old Exxon big oil, okay? So one's a growth story, one's a value story. So with IBM, your $1,000 today is worth $600,000. Oh, I'm sorry, $800,000. Good investment, anybody complain about that? No, that's a great investment. However, Exxon, $1.6 million. What's the difference? Where my, with my bright students out there, wh what's the reason for the difference? <laughs> Dividends is incorrect. Anybody else want to give an answer? Gets an A. Valuation. 
during most of this period of time, investors constantly overvalued the growth stock, IBM. The P.E. ratio was constantly higher. So when you reinvested those dividends, dividends are an important factor here, when you reinvested the dividends, you got a much better deal with Exxon than you did with IBM. And over a 65-year period of time, it made a difference where you doubled your money by going with the value stock. So this is an important lesson that Jeremy Siegel, the Wizard of Wharton, we required his book, Stocks for the Long Run, for my students, really important. So this is an important chart also about dividends. The yellow line is non-dividend paying stocks, clearly the most volatile. The red line are dividend cutters, companies that cut their dividend, worst performer. And the blue line is uh, dividend growers, companies that had a dividend increase. Now, by investing in dividend stocks, do you avoid the boom-bust cycle? Do you avoid bear markets? No, you don't. You go through the cycle. But it cushions the fall. That's all it does. It cushions the fall. And on the upside, when the market's going up, it tends to outperform. So dividends are a great way to go, especially dividend growers. So that's what I specialize on with my swan strategy, okay? So sleep well stocks have to have the following three criteria. This is what I talked about yesterday in the panel on gold stocks. I said, do we have any sleep well stocks in gold? And the panelists said, no, you're, you're awake all the time saying, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, number one, stocks that are consistently profitable in a growth industry, you gotta have that. See, that throws out almost all gold stocks, right? Right there on the spot. Not all of them, but most of them. Number two, stocks that enjoy above average dividend yield. What's the average yield of an S&P 500 stock? 2%, 2%. So we want above 2%. And number three, stocks that have a rising dividend policy. That's what we want. So we like what Lowell Miller calls peace of mind investing, we want high quality companies with a high yield and growth of yield gives you high total return. Does that sound like a, sweep, a sleep well strategy? These are white swans, not our black swans here. So I'll go through five examples of this. Uh, Main Street Capital is something I recommend every year. How many have heard of Main Street Capital? Okay, the hands are growing. I've been doing this for like five years at the Las Vegas Money Show. The first time I did this, not a single hand went up. Then the next year I recommended in my newsletter and more hands went up. And today you can see uh, lots of hands are going up and that's great because Main Street Capital is a private equity stock that has some very unique features. First of all, it's famous for investing in and funding private companies that are mainly family organized, uh, uh, family run uh, franchises, like a diamond uh, store or something like that that wants to expand. Now, 13% of its portfolio is in energy related st stocks, uh, private companies, and that's why it's been kind of flat lately, hasn't really done a lot. By the way, the, all of my charts are. Uh, without the dividends. So it's not a total return chart. If you had a total return chart, this chart would blow your mind. It would really be impressive because it's earning, it's been earning dividends of about 10% a year. This is the best of the breed of the business development companies. Why do I say that? Because out of the 2,370 stocks that trade on the stock exchanges today, 2,370. By the way, it used to be 5,000 stocks traded on stock exchanges. Do you know why it's declined and almost cut in half? And why companies are going private or bankrupt? Regulation. We have several A students here. This is terrific. So, uh, but we're down to 2,370 stocks. It might come to a point where there's only 100 stocks to trade. Instead of the S&P 500, we'll have the S&P 100, and that'll be it. But then we'll be like Argentina or Venezuela. We don't want that, do we? 
Now, it could happen. The way this election is headed, we can only go downhill, folks. I mean, really. Can't we get somebody to really make America great again with really good policies and not closing our doors to the world? Oh, my gosh. Anyway. Uh, so Main Street Capital of 2,370 stocks, it has the most unique feature. It is the only stock that pays monthly dividends plus two special dividends a year. Average annual dividend yield of 10% right now. So the net asset value hasn't been moving much because they've been paying it out on dividends, but they get equity kickers when they, when they fund these companies, these private companies, they try to uh, get them to go public or to be bought out, and when they do, they get uh, an equity benefit, and this happens from time to time, so that gives them capital gains. So I've been calling this the super annuity, the super annuity, because the average annuity, if you talk to the annuity people, the average annuity lifetime payout per month annualized is what, anybody know what you get on your money? 3%. 3% is all you get on fixed annuities right now. This pays 10%, and I think we'll continue to pay 10%. Monthly dividends plus two special dividends, which they, they pay out regularly. So this is worth the price of this conference, which is zero, but. <laughs> 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 All right, so you got a free conference, so you owe me. You owe me big time, so you can come to Freedom Fest and pay me back. Omega Healthcare Investors, is my second sleep well at sto uh, stock. It's, it's, it's a little bit more volatile than, and it's kind of topped out here, but it's moving up now above its moving average. This is the uh, uh, nation's largest uh, nursing home REIT. So as I suggest to my investors, whenever I speak, I speak uh, uh, about the glories of the nursing homes. How many have been to nursing homes recently? Isn't it fantastic? I mean, they, they take care of people like you would not believe. Now they pay, it's kind of a high price. By the way, the uh, profit margin is 30% with this company. Why? Well, when you see the price, the sticker price of these nursing homes, but they're fantastic. Can't you wait? To, you just can't wait to get into a nursing home, right? How many of you are, I'm wake, am I waking anybody up here or are you all asleep like you're the nursing home, already in the nursing home? <laughs> anyway, I can't wait to get in a nursing home because I'm going to have a load of this stock and I'm going to go around to everybody saying, isn't it fantastic? We're making money on the, 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 the nursing home that we're living in. Can't get any better than that. Anyway, talk about rising dividend. It's increased its dividend 15 times in a row every quarter. 15 times in a row. Yield is 7%. So even if it stays flat, who cares? They're making a lot of money. But it's in the baby boomer retirement stage. We all know that, that that's a positive. So this is a great way to invest in the newsletter. You all have a copy of my newsletter, right? So this, these are in my newsletter. And by the way, we, we do have a special offer that I mentioned before of... Uh, nor normally $99 to subscribe uh, for new subscribers, but if you do it in this room, you see Roger or John in the back, it's just $77. You get an autograph, autograph copy of my book. Um, and uh, it's really a great deal. I hope you'll take advantage of that. And I talk about these investments, keep you up to date. It's very important. So my, uh, I've written my newsletter since 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected president. Uh, and uh, and I, I consider myself a survivor. I've been doing my newsletter for 36 years. I'm still very active. I can still play basketball. They call me the Stephen Curry of, uh, of whatever city I'm in. <laughs> so I have to live up to a reputation. Um, so I stay active and I'm planning to write a book called 50 Years on Wall Street. So that would be in 2030. So you... You're, you're going to see me kicking around here like uh, Richard Nixon for many years. You can count on that. So Enterprise Products uh, Partners is um, 
uh, has outdone uh, Omega Healthcare. Enterprise Products Partners is the Houston-based pipeline company. Of course, it's uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the most successful, it's the best of the breed of the master limited partnerships in energy. But of course, it's gone through this major bear market, a lot of panic selling, you can see that, panic selling on the downside. All the weak investors are gone. So the stock is moving up. Above its moving average, it's a little bit halting, up and down. Wall Street exaggerates everything. But this is a very sound company of a future of energy that's a very dynamic sector. The pipeline company is a great way to play it. Uh, cash flow is really very positive and actually increasing, even though revenues and earnings, uh, well, revenues were up, but earnings were down in the last quarter. But the big story here is that <clears throat> they have enough to have paid for 45. Remember, Omega had increased its dividend 15 times in a row. Well, this, this one's increased its dividend 45 times in a row. It has the Guinness Book of World Records. You have a question? Well, Wall Street exaggerates everything. Number one uh, lesson in Wall Street, he's asking, uh, was it be beat down unnecessarily? Yes, all of the good analysts out there, including the Motley Fool, said that this was deeply uh, oversold and was a screaming bargain. And we were making that point while it was dipping down there. It actually got under $20 a share. Normally, I use a stop order of around 20%. If a stock declines 20%, I'm out. Uh, but I made an exception with enterprise products uh, because it was continuing to increase its dividend and cash flow was still very positive and they were making enough money. It wasn't return of capital. <clears throat> but enterprise did make some mistakes. They overexpanded with the pipeline boom going on with fracking and stuff. All of the pipeline companies overbuilt including enterprise, and it's a heavy debt industry. So they deserve to be hit a little bit, no doubt about that. But they're making a very strong comeback. And throughout that time period, they did not cut their dividend like a lot of other companies did. So this is best of the breed. I'm really comfortable with this. You may not sleep as well with this portfolio, but at least that's one that I think would be very positive, and I like this story a lot. <clears throat> Those of you who would really like to have a sleep well stock, uh, the Swiss are famous for uh, responding to the question, if I could put one stock certificate in a Swiss vault and leave it there for 50 years, what stock would it be? And the answer that, the answer that was made in the 70s and 80s was what? What do you think that stock was? <laughs> GM. No, not really. It was IBM. IBM was the stock that Swiss bankers would say put in and forget about it because it's going to be a winner. Well, it's Microsoft now. It's Microsoft. So Microsoft has a great track record. And what's interesting about Microsoft is that what I like about it is there's a lot of doubting Thomases out there. <clears throat> so what happens is the, uh, there's an earnings surprise. The stock uh, goes up on earnings because it, it beats estimates, and then all the doubting Thomases come out and it starts going down, 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 down. And then they, they have an earnings surprise again, and the stock shoots up. And then you have the doubting Thomases, down, 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 down. And then the earnings comes out, and it shoots up again because it's, it's a surprise, it's a positive. They can't believe it. And then it drops, dun, 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 dun. So it's dropping down, 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 down because it had an earnings surprise. It's been drifting down. Earnings surprise coming up next month. So uh, this is a good time to be buying Microsoft. Rising dividend policy, about 3% dividend. Has $55 billion in debt, but $110 billion in cash. So. <laughs> A uh, new CEO from India, a very bright guy through uh, over the years. So, And uh, Microsoft, by the way, big announcement, Microsoft is coming to Freedom Fest. Uh, so that shows you we've, we've really hit the big time when you have a company like that who's going to be speaking and, and uh, talking about pr privacy issues and 
They're uh, in league with Apple to defend the privacy of your cell phones and your telecommunications from the government snooping. Uh, despite all the, you can still have security and, and, and still also, you, you can be safe, but you can also have your privacy. And that's what Microsoft and Apple and others are trying to achieve. So anyway, Microsoft is really a great story. I hope you consider adding to that. And uh, last but not least, I have added a, a mining company. Uh, I, I got out of uh, gold and silver back in late 2011. A good call. That was one of my better calls, uh, getting out of, and, and not getting back in at all until a couple months ago, we got into Franco, Nevada, and we chose, again, the best of the breed. This is a royalty company. What do we mean by a royalty company? They do not mine gold and silver. What they do is they finance companies that do mine gold and silver, and in return, they get gold and silver at a discount, and they make money on the spread. So gold right now is around $1,300 an ounce. They, Franco Nevada gets it for 800 bucks. So they make, they make a nice profit. Uh, and then they sell it for 1300. They get it for 800 and they sell it for 1300. In the case of silver, uh, silver is selling for $17 and change. They get it for 10 bucks. Buy it at 10, sell it at 17. So they make money every year and they increase their dividend. So, you know, it's not a lot, it's 1.5%, but for mining companies, that's above average because the uh, average dividend yield for mining stocks is 0 0.02% or something like that. It's, it's pretty tiny. Most mining companies lose money, but throughout all of this bear, this is a bear market in, in gold and silver until recently. Now, a lot of you think maybe I better not buy it. It hit $70 a share, we're up 30%. So I'm kinda, I'd like to see a little bit of correction, but we're just not seeing it. I think people are, are kind of afraid of, of where we're headed in this country and around the world. Do you have a question? Yes, that's a good sign. I love it when we, these analysts say, oh my gosh, downgrading. So, the, you know, the, the downgrading sometimes does affect stock prices. Sometimes it does. <clears throat> it really varies. Uh, there's no predictability in the analysts upgrading or downgrading. Uh, sometimes it really has a positive impact or a negative impact, and then sometimes it doesn't. So what's, the, what's it selling at? Well, was it 70? Maybe it got knocked down a little bit. Maybe that's your buying opportunity. It's hard to say. All right. <clears throat> By the way, Franco Nevada has 18 employees. You know how many employees Gold Corp has? 250. So these streaming companies, are uh, royalty companies, are really cost conscious. So you can, you can count on these people coming through for you. A couple of quotes from the Maxims of Wall Street. This one from Steve Forbes, who said at Freedom Fest, everyone is a disciplined, long-term investor until the market goes down. Yeah, so true. There's just so much power in, the, in this book. I hope you all get a copy of this book. I, I, we have another, I brought three boxes, we're only down to one box. So if you'd like a copy of this, it's $20 for the first copy, $10 for additional copies because they're, they're a beautiful, lightweight, for those of you who are traveling, lightweight book that you can take with you. And it's not just a quote book, I actually break them into various categories, like uh, I have sections on fundamental versus technical analysis, gold bugs, bull and bears, income investing. I have a whole section called how to make a million in the stock market. Start with two million. <laughs> how do you make a million in the stock market? Marry a millionaire, better yet, divorce one. Uh, how do you make a million dollars? Start with 900,000. It's kind of subtle. 
And last but not least, how do you make a million dollars? Borrow a million dollars and pay it off. And that's real estate. So there's a lot of gems in this book that I think you'll, uh, you'll appreciate. Um, so I hope you'll pick up a copy. And it's free, by the way, five minutes, thank you. It's free, by the way, if you subscribe to the newsletter for just $77 here, but you have to do it here in the room with uh, Roger and, uh, and uh, John in the back. And that applies to those who would like to renew their subscription. Okay, so, oh wait a minute, I forgot my quote from J. Paul Getty from the book How to Be Rich as opposed to How to Get Rich by Donald Trump. The big profits go to the intelligent, careful, and patient investor, not to the reckless and overeager speculator. So those of you who are in this room, I think qualify for the first. And then finally, my favorite quote from John D. Rockefeller himself, do you know the only thing that gives me pleasure not my wife, not my kids, not my colleagues, not my friends. It's seeing my dividends come in. <laughs> oh, now how many, is, how many fit, fit that criteria? How many John D. Rockefellers do? Oh, we have one guy in the back, yep. Yep, he and Joe Kennedy, they're, they're close there like that, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna switch to, the, this is the book. This is a picture of me with Warren Buffett, who loves my book. By the way, he considers it his favorite quote book. And why? He's quoted more than anyone else. That's why. So anyway, that's our offer there, which is, I uh, hope I've repeated a couple times. This is the Freedom Fest conference that <laughs> Kim Githler allows me to uh, recommend. She's a big supporter. She's kind of the, the, the godmother of Freedom Fest because she helped us got started. So here's a, here's a picture of me with uh, Donald Trump from last year's Freedom Fest, which was on 7-Eleven in Las Vegas. How many were there? Standing room only in the celebrity ballroom. This guy, it was unbelievable. It was quite a circus. So anyway, <clears throat> my wife's kind of embarrassed about this picture because look where Donald Trump's hand is. <clears throat> and, and she said it was moving up. <clears throat> so <clears throat> anyway, that's Donald Trump. Great quote from Donald Trump. Skousens are so good looking they belong in my cabinet. That's a fake quote, by the way. But he does promise people, believe me, all the time, stuff like that. Anyway, Freedom Fest is going to be huge. To quote Donald Trump, uh, <clears throat> our big speaker is going to be uh, George Foreman, who sold his grill business for $138 million. We're very excited about having him come. And we just confirmed Senator Rand Paul coming, uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Um, <clears throat> we, Kennedy <clears throat> from Fox News is going to be there, so a lot of great people. I have a few minutes, so is there any questions you have on any of my investments or uh, suggestions and so forth? Yes? <clears throat> Pardon? How long do I hold on to a uh, single stock? Oh, my personal. You mean in my newsletter or myself? Oh. <clears throat> well, my biggest position right now is Main Street Capital in my own uh, portfolio. Omega Healthcare and Enterprise Products are also in there. And I've held them for, since I found out about them, five or six years ago. I haven't sold any of those positions. I consider them good long-term positions. So yes, those are, those are important positions to have. Um, so if you look in the newsletter, I pretty much have almost every investment that I recommend in my newsletter. And uh, Mark Holbert, a financial digest that finally stopped publishing last month, his newsletter started the same time as my newsletter, so I outlived the, the, the guy who, who reviews newsletters. Anyway, he had me uh, beating the market for the last 15 years, so I'd like to think that I've improved uh, in my newsletter over time. I, I get lots of compliments and lots of uh, letters from people who have done very well with uh, my newsletter. Anyone here want to raise their hand and say they've done well with my newsletter? A couple of people, that's right. People here on the front row, that's right, yeah, very good. Uh, any other questions that you have? So there's the green form in the newsletter. Uh, fill that out if you'd like a subscription, if you'd like a free copy of my book or several copies for friends. You have a question? Yes, do you have an opinion on cigarette stocks in general, uh, <coughs> in particular? 
<coughs> yes, uh, I've been recommending Philip Morris more than Altria, but we hold both of them in our VICE fund, V-I-C-E-X is the symbol. It's outperformed the market this year, anytime there's uncertainty. It's just amazing to me, and they're still staying with their business of, of largely selling cigarettes. And uh, it, it's a worldwide business, although Altria focuses primarily in the United States. Philip Morris is international. Uh, Philip Morris has outperformed Altria, but both of them continue to have a rising dividend policy. So uh, strictly from an investment point of view, I mean, I'm not a big fan of, of cigarette smoking, but they still allow it in Las Vegas. Uh, and so uh, we continue to recommend it. You know, I hate the government's attitude of forcing people to stop. I mean, uh, th th this has unintended consequences when government gets involved in that way. Yes. I didn't get the rest of your question. Yeah, the three, the three were quality company that's making money in a growing industry, number one. Number two, it had to be an above average dividend, so I'm not buying new companies at all. Above average dividend, so it has to have a dividend pro, a program. And number three, it has to have a rising dividend program where it increases its dividend over time and does not cut its dividend at any time. So all of the stocks that I have up here qualified for a rising dividend policy, quality company, and so on. Well, with that, thank you all very much. Look forward to signing your books and meet back there with Roger and John if you're interested in the newsletter. Thank you very much.